Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being in our class this morning. We also welcome those of you who are joining us by means of live stream. And however you may be joining us, we're glad that you could be a part of this discussion today. I want to ask again this morning if there is anyone in class who has not yet received a book, if you'll just raise your hand, we'll bring you one right now. Anybody need a book? Okay, I want to make sure because next week they're going to go on sale. There'll be like $10 a book next week. So if you want one for free, you need to go ahead and get it this week. All right, very, very good. Thank you so much for being in class today. And I would invite your attention as we begin this morning to the book of Esther, please. The great Old Testament story of Esther. 17th book in Scripture. This morning we begin our study together at chapter 2. Esther in the providence of God. As we begin to learn about the girl who becomes queen. So as you are looking at your foundation study guide this morning, let me mention a change of schedule that we are going to be working with. Both next Sunday and the Sunday after, it is my understanding that Bible classes will not meet. That's next Sunday and the Sunday after. So that would be Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. There will not be Bible school classes. So in the interest of maintaining the continuity of the storyline, what we're going to do is we're just going to work in the text to a good stopping point each week, and then we will resume the story in our next class. Now, that's not going to match up exactly with where the foundation lessons are divided, but you know what? I am confident we'll survive. We'll make it. So let me get, begin just now by reminding you of something that we have talked about the last two weeks. The entire narrative of the life of Esther, this great story that makes up the book called Esther, is a book about God. And though the name God nowhere appears, it never appears in the text at all. This is a story that is all about the power and the plan and the providence of our great God. It's about the activity of God in the affairs of men. It's about the activity of God in the affairs of of this world. It's a story that is about the fact that we serve a God who is alive and well, a God who has called all of us to his kingdom for such a time as this. So God's people now find themselves somewhere around 500 BC in Babylonian captivity under the rule of the Medo-Persian Empire led by a king whose name is Xerxes. And there is a plot that is developing that on a particular day of a certain month that the Jews, the people of God, will be wiped from the face of the earth. And you know and I know that if that were to be allowed to happen, the plan of God given first to Abraham and carried for all of those many generations to bring the Christ from the lineage of the tribe of Judah, that plan would not happen. I've also told you each week, and I'll probably continue to say this every week that we study together, no one interrupts the plans of God. No man thwarts the plans of the Heavenly Father. No one interrupts God's will. And this story is a story about the great strength and the power and the providence of our God. And folks, is it not the greatest need that we have in our world today to just see God. People need to see and to know God, to see a God who is alive, to see that he is at work, to understand that he cares about them, he loves them, he is patient and long-suffering with them, to understand that God is and that God is still very much in control. Now, you know all of us, we're human beings. We are made of flesh and bone, and, and there are times, quite frankly, that our faith in that idea is not as strong as it is at other times. There are times, quite frankly, that, that we just wonder where God is. Is God there? Does he care? You're in trouble. You're, you're needing a job. You've just been given the worst of news from a doctor. Some dreadful event has happened in your life, and you're down on your knees, and you're asking for help, and, and, and 
It's a natural human response at times to just wonder if God is really there. God, are you there? And God, do you know my situation and do you care? We need this story. We need to be reminded that God is right where he is supposed to be. And we need not forget that the final chapter of all of our lives has not yet been written. But back to that statement that I continue to make over and over again, no one derails the plans of God. God has a plan for you and a plan for me. He has a plan for all of our lives. And so we've spent some time just being introduced to the characters of this story. Xerxes is the king. Vashti is his queen. We've learned in the last two lessons that the king is a hard-partying, self-indulgent egotist if you ever saw one. Gave a party that lasted six solid months. I don't know about you, but I'm not much of the partying type. You know, if I'm invited to a party, I'm sort of the guy that uh, is the party pooper. Don't mean to be. It's just a party's just not really my kind of thing. For one thing, most of the time, if somebody has a party this time of year, there's a holiday party. By the time you're supposed to be there and it's time for the party to start, usually that's past my bedtime, you know. I'm used to being in bed by that time. I don't see how people do it. But he gave a party that lasted six solid months, and right after that, he had another one that he's been involved in that included some serious drinking, and this thing's been going on for a week. And in the midst of the drunken frolic, in the midst of trying to impress all of these nobles that he wants to see how powerful he is and how much wealth he has and all of the beautiful women in his harem, he sends for the queen to come in and display herself before the group to which she said, it ain't happening. It's not going to happen. Consequently, she is banished as queen. We laughed a little bit last week as the advice was given to Xerxes, King, if you let her get away with this, do you realize what's going to happen to all of us men? All these women are going to think they're as good as we are. And if the queen can back talk the king and get away with it, there'll be no end to this thing. We'll all be in big trouble. And so she is banished, and the women of the land are officially reminded, ladies, the men are in charge. And you had better do as you are instructed. But now old Xerxes has a problem. He is a king who has no queen. In the supporting cast, we will encounter Mordecai, who I, I would argue in many ways is the hero of the story. He is Esther's cousin, and he is indeed a faithful Jew. Not just a Jew in name only. Mordecai is a Jew in practice and in conviction. And Mordecai has brought up Esther as his own daughter. He has reared her, raised her in a foreign land, and he's taught her to love and to serve God. He is a good, good man. Esther is the heroine of the story, and we will meet before we stop for the morning the villain of the story, Haman, and we will come to understand the position to which he has attained. Now, I told you last time, and I want to remind you again just now, that at stake is the Jewish existence and survival. At stake is the will and the plan of God that would ultimately culminate in the coming of Jesus. But also bear in mind, there is really, there is no strain in the narrative. There is no suspense at all from the perspective of God. There's certainly great suspense among the Jews, in the heart of Mordecai and Esther, even on those who were on the other side and were opposed to them. But God isn't about to let a pagan king and his minions triumph. You know, I think in a practical way, we get, we get so worried and so upset about the church. And I understand that. I've had those thoughts, and I've, I've expressed those feelings from time to time. And I, I will hear people say pretty regularly, oh, man, if you just look at the world and you look at the church and things that are happening and, and, and how most all churches are seeing a, a countrywide decline in their numbers, church is just going down the tubes, you know. Things have gotten so bad, and I just, I don't know what we're going to do. And we fret, and, and we worry so. And I've said before, you know, the Catholics have this, and we have this. This is what we do. 
You know, we sort of wring our hands and, and, and we say, it's just so bad and terrible. And if it goes the way it's going now, it's not going to be long. One of these days, maybe even in our lifetime, the church won't even be here. Let me just remind you that the church is here to stay. It will see change. It will see transition. And it will see times when the numbers are on the rise and times when they are not. But I would remind us that the Bible teaches us that it is the church of the living God. And I would also remind us that when Jesus established it, he said the gates of hell itself will never prevail against my church. Will the gates of hell fight it? You better know it. The gates of hell will fight it every single day, but Satan and the world will never prevail. Never. So that means you know the end of the story even before we get there. You know the end of the story really before it happens, and that means you know the end of our story. You should. You should know the end of this story that includes all of us, this day, this time, the church as we know it before it happens. So if we know that, if in our hearts and if in our minds we really do know and understand that, then let me ask you something. Why do we live so often like we don't know it? Why do we live so often like we don't know the ending? Well, for the last two weeks, we have read and discussed chapter 1, so I hope you've had time now to find Esther chapter 2 in your own Bible. Today we come to chapter 2, but before we actually read from chapter 2, let me just ask you to turn the page back, if you would. And I want to pick up the reading so we're in full and complete context. Chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. Therefore, if it pleases the king, his wise men advise, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Now, there's one thing you need to be reminded of with this guy. If you tell him something he doesn't want to hear, you won't be telling him that a second time. You will, she will never be allowed to be in his presence again. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands, from the least to the greatest. And the king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as Mimukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. Vashti is deposed. Xerxes is a king with no queen. And thus begins chapter 2 and the overwhelming evidence of the workings of God. Let's read. Later, when the anger of Xerxes had subsided... He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, Let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king, and let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women." and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. So let's pause right here. Do you see what's happening? Do you get what's going on here? They are about to hold a Miss Persian Empire contest. That's what's going to happen. Now, how would you like that, guy, that job, guys? Your job is to be one of the king's personal attendants, to go out into all the land and to bring back the most beautiful women, the most beautiful young virgins that you can find from all of the many provinces. Most men would think that's a pretty good job. So the Miss Persian Empire contest is on. And isn't it odd? Isn't it, isn't it a coincidence that Esther will be selected out of all of the women in the land to be a finalist. Isn't it odd that she will ultimately win that contest and be the one found to be most pleasing to the king? Well, it is not. It is not odd. It is not coincidental. It is not luck. 
if you believe that God's in charge of what's going on here, if you believe in the power and the plan and the providence of God. And if you do believe that, friends, this was a one-woman contest. It really was. Yeah, there were lots of other women who were there. Matter of fact, if the, if the man in charge followed his directions, and I'm sure he did, there were lots of good-looking women there. There might have been hundreds of them. Could have even been thousands. But in the will of God, it was a foregone conclusion that Esther would win this thing. Now, the plan was pretty interesting. I hope you see it there in the text. The plan was bring in all of these beautiful girls and place them under the care of Haggai, who was a eunuch, by the way, and he would be in charge. Notice what would happen. They would all get beauty treatments, and then Xerxes would just pick the one he liked best, the one who pleased him most, and she would be the new queen instead of Vashti. That's a pretty good plan. It appealed to the king's ego. He liked it. The text says it pleased him. And are you aware that you are known by the things that please you? Have you thought about that? You're known by the things that please you. That's how, that's how people know you for the most part, unless you disguise it well. Certainly how God knows you. You're known by the books you read, by the company you keep. I could look at your checkbook and see what you spend your money on, and I could say, these are the things that are important in your life. It, it's true of all of us. We are all found out by what pleases us. Well, with Xerxes, we've already found out what pleases him. A, a lot of bragging, a lot of drinking, a whole lot of beautiful women all around him and about which he could say, these belong to me. These are all mine. Well, let's go back to the text now and Resume at verse 5. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jer, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. So Mordecai is a captive. He is one of the many people of God enslaved by a pagan nation. You might recall that when Jesus walked on this earth, God's people were enslaved again. Only this time they were enslaved by the Romans. And you might think that we are enslaved right now by a pagan government, and I think you could probably make a pretty good case to prove your point. But service to God goes on. Service to God does not stop. And I realize that all of us have preferences and personal choices about who we would like to see in charge and who we would not like to see in charge, but just bear in mind and learn from this story that our service to God, our commitment to God, our faith in God goes on. We're not citizens of this world. We're, we're aliens here. So Mordecai is a captive, and yet Mordecai, we learn, is completely dedicated to God, to the will of God, to serving God. Verse 7, Mordecai had a cousin, a cousin named Hadassah, whom he brought up because she had neither father nor mother. The girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features. And Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Now keep in mind that, that the king's ambassadors are out all over the land looking for young ladies who are lovely in form and features and right here is the loveliest of them all when the king's order and edict had been proclaimed many girls were brought to the citadel of susa and put under the care of haggai and esther also was taken to the king's palace so the plot now thickens and we have a hard time wrapping our minds around this because of our cultural differences. So let's, let's just address that for a moment. When, when, when one of the representatives of Xerxes comes and says, you are a beautiful woman, you are lovely in form and feature, and the king is looking for someone like you, you need to come with me. They went. They went. You come for a woman like that today, and, and there's several things that are going to happen to you. First of all, you'll be charged with sexual harassment. You'll likely be sued. You might even be put in jail. And with a lot of women out there today, you will probably be on the receiving end some, some serious bodily harm if you try to forcibly take some woman by the arm and tell her this is where you're going. But not then. 
in Babylonian culture, when the king sent for a woman, she went. And not really just in their culture. I'll give you another example, and it's one that stings us a little bit more. You think about David and Bathsheba. When the king sins for a woman, there's not a debate. There's not representation by her attorney. The king sends, you come. And before you start with, well, I just don't understand Esther going. I just, I don't understand it. You're right. You don't understand. The penalty for any disobedience to the king was severe. So no judging the character of Esther just here at all. We know that she is not evil. We know, as she is described to us in the Scripture, that she has no evil intent. We know that Mordecai, a godly man who raised her, brought her upright. But the text says that Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. And to be sure, the king's ladies were well provided for. The girl Esther pleased Haggai and won his favor. And this is a significant point. Haggai has seen a lot of women. Probably most men in the kingdom would have loved to have had his job. He was in the presence of the most beautiful women in the whole empire. The only ones fit for a king. He'd seen them all. But when he saw Esther, he saw that she was not only a beautiful woman, but there was just something else. There was just something else about her. There was something special about her her presence, something about her character, something that made her stand out. So listen to what he did. Immediately, he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. And then something else very important. Look at verse 10. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background. Nobody knows. Nobody knows that she is a Jew. Mordecai had forbidden her to tell it. This little piece of information is something that will loom very, very large as the story unfolds. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. And every day, he, Mordecai, walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. You know, I read this part of the story, and in my mind, I just sort of imagine Mordecai out there throwing pebbles against the window to try and get somebody's attention, you know. How is Esther? Can somebody give me a report on Esther? Is she okay? Mordecai cares every single day about what happens to her. And then verse 12 begins to reveal to us something about what goes on in the harem, about what a girl's life is like in this process before a girl's turn hmm how you like that statement before a girl's turn you think they felt like a person or like an object before a girl's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there. And in the morning returned to another part of the harem to the care of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubine. She was now a concubine. She was no longer a beautiful young virgin. And she would return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. Now, you know, I've read this over and over and over again, and I've thought, is there some way that you can sort of sugarcoat this? There's really not, you know. So I'm just going to put it out there. Friends, this is the original one-night stand right here. And all of those guys are dead, right? They're all dead and gone. We certainly wouldn't have anyone like that in our governmental high places today, would we? Surely we wouldn't have anyone like that. To the king, the woman was no more than number 422 or whatever her number was he doesn't even know their name and they would bring the woman in 
And the text is very clear that most after that night, they would never see him again. And I just, I just have to go back to those, to those beauty treatments for a moment. A woman before seeing the king undergoes 12 months of beauty treatments. Now, let's run this through the filter of we've already been told that these are the most beautiful young women in the entire land. Wonder how many months it would take if they just brought some ugly old girls in there, you know? Mary Kay and Avon would have done a landslide business right here, don't you think? Six months of treatment with oil of myrrh, six more months with perfumes and cosmetics, and then she could take anything she wanted with her as her turn came to go to the king. I'm not sure the full implication of that, but here's what I am sure of. They were pampered, and they were coddled, and they were prepared for his majesty, and the vast majority of all of them, all except the one that he would select, all for a one-night stand. And you know your heart, my heart just begins to pound a little bit when I get to verse 15. When I get to verse 15, as it says, when the turn came for Esther. You know, I read this story and all that I've learned about her and her character and about Mordecai and how he raised her, and I don't want her going in there. I don't want Esther being treated like this. Dirty, rotten guy who has no idea and who doesn't really care what kind of a good woman that she is. When the turn came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king. She asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. Now, if you happen to have a King James translation that you're using, you might take note that the King James says she required nothing. She required nothing. All the oil and perfumes and cosmetics, all of those things used to make people over, I think the text is very clear in suggesting didn't mean too much just here. She didn't need it. She didn't need it. And you know, if you read that and think about its meaning, you begin to understand just how beautiful this girl really is. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. Now, I believe there's more meant by that statement than just a measurement of how she appeared physically. I think we're talking about that something special, about her character that also radiated from her. I think it was easy to see the kind of woman that she had become. And so the text tells us she was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. And then we're told now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. My conclusion is that Xerxes has been around the counterfeit for so long that something this real and this genuine just knocked him out. So he set a royal crown on her head, and he made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet Esther's banquet for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. The first tax bait, rebate that you read about in the Bible right there. Verse 19. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Ah, now we have come to realize something about Mordecai. That's his job. Mordecai is keeper of the gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. Boy, that's an interesting point, don't you think? And I could point out something else important about now Queen Esther. There's a whole lot of people in this world who are dramatically changed when they get power. There's a lot of people in this world who are dramatically changed when they get money, when they get position, when they get 
prestige. You can see it exampled before you every single day, and all the way through the Bible you can see examples of that, certainly in our own society. And you see those folks that when the power and the fame and the fortune comes their way, Man, they just seem to throw in the towel on everything they ever were, everything they've ever known, everything they'd ever been taught. It's important to point out, not Esther. Though she is now first lady of the Medo-Persian Empire, she continues to maintain her standards and her character. She continues to live the way that she always has. As a matter of fact, the text says she continues to listen to and remember the upbringing, she continues to do exactly what Mordecai has told her to do. Well, verse 21. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bithana and Tiresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry. and They conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. I don't know, maybe they were muttering under their breath and he heard it. Maybe they were bragging about it. Maybe they made the statement, we're going to get this guy someday, someday soon. But Mordecai found out about the plot, told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. How did we uncover this plot, the king asked. My relative Mordecai discovered and reported it. And when the report was investigated... And found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows. There's a lot of hanging that goes on in this story. They were hanged on a gallows. Now, I don't know. It says when the report was investigated and found to be true. It doesn't tell us how they found it to be true. I don't know if they did a separate investigation. In my mind, considering how Xerxes ruled his empire... I sort of picture them putting these two guys on the rack and stretching them a little bit, and once they confessed, they went straight to the gallows. And something significant just here that we will see again before it is all said and done. After all of this, it was recorded in the book of Annals in the presence of the king. It was written down. It was recorded in the chronicles of the king, and it was done in his presence. That will loom very large in the outcome. I did not realize, but I understand from listening to a news story I heard not long ago, that when the President of the United States makes a phone call, every word that is said on both sides of that phone call, it's transcribed. It's kept for historical record. I mean, the poor guy can't sneeze and wipe his nose. He can't go to the bathroom. He can't do anything that somebody's not recording it, writing it down, making a record of it. Here are all the people who've come to see him today. Here's who he had lunch with. And, and while they had lunch together, here's what they had for lunch. And here's how many glasses of tea they drank. And, and so this was written down. It was recorded in the Chronicles of the King. Every word of it, everything that had happened. And it will loom very large in the outcome. So you come to chapter 3 and verse 1 that reads, After these events... King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. Now, just trust me when I tell you we won't go into this fully today. Haman is a bad, bad man, a nasty, na really nasty guy. He's the villain of the story. And Haman is going to find himself on a head-on collision course with Mordecai, with Esther, and ultimately with God himself. And do you know what happened in, that, in the course of that collision? Well, I'm going to tell you the first week of the new year. We're not going to go fully into that story today. But I want to remind you that, that in this great and marvelous story of Esther and Mordecai. I want to keep coming back to the point because it's important. This is an even greater story about God. I'm afraid this is one of those texts that sometimes gets overlooked in all of our Bible study and all of our teaching, but it shouldn't be. It's about a God who is alive and in this world. It's about a God who has a plan for you, just exactly like he had a plan for Esther. It's about a God who wants you to answer his calling, whose desire is that you would obey his will and live with him 
forever. God's providence works for those who are determined to obey him. I hope as we finish out 2023 and we think about a new year, you know, when you come to a new year, you get a clean slate. You, you turn the page and it's fresh and new and clean. And I hope we'll think as we move into 2024, I hope we'll give serious consideration to the fact God is giving us yet another opportunity, another, another chance to start over, another chance to love him more, to love others more, to do better, to be more committed to his will. And I think this is an appropriate story for this time in our lives and for this time of year because certainly we will learn those lessons very well from the book of Esther. Well, I thank you for being in class today. Do not forget, now if you show up for Sunday school next Sunday, you'll be sitting here all alone. Thank you for being in class today.